Well, good morning again, everybody. Morning. Happy Sabbath, and uh, to everyone watching online, happy Sabbath to you too. And uh, welcome all, Yorley. Good on to see you, Bill. Hi, Mum. How are you? And uh, we've got Jess and Emma about to walk through the door as well. And we welcome you to worship today. And if you are visiting, we give you a very warm welcome. <laughs> and may you be blessed by God today. Now we have a couple of birthdays coming up this month. We say happy birthday to Amelia, having a birthday, Maula, and Kath on Monday, Kath Wallen. Today, Anders is preaching from John 18 in the garden, and today's offering goes to our local church for ministry and maintenance and we thank you for your support. Thank Leone for the beautiful flowers up on the behind me here. And if anyone does have flowers in your garden that you're prepared to share, can you please bring it to Sabbath? On the Friday, if you can, and just leave it inside the hall out there, that'd be great, thank you. Sing along today, 5.30, so make sure you come along and Sing your heart out today. We've got Amy leading in the singing and Leone has a devotional. Prayer meeting, Tuesday, 7.15. Come along and enjoy prayer and the study of the book of Acts. Now, next Sabbath is pray service and guess what? Church lunch. How good is that? And uh, please remember, everyone, there's a little box on the desk in the foyer there to remember our children and youth ministry. It gives you all the instructions in your little pamphlet here as to what you need to do to support the um, children and youth ministry here on Norfolk Island. And I do believe that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Happy morning, Yoli. Been how a good week? Yeah. That's good. That's good. That's good. We're going to stand and sing our first song, which is "In the Garden." And this, the title of the sermon today is "In the Garden" as well, so it kind of, kind of fits. So we're going to stand and sing this wonderful song. It's almost like a Norfolk um, classic. I'm, I'm hearing. So I come to the garden alone.
We invite you to kneel as we seek God in prayer. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, it is good to be able to come and uh, worship you this morning for the beauty of the day outside, for the way you have blessed us with uh, rain and so many other blessings, Lord, we, uh, we thank you. We thank you for your invitation to remember you this day especially and for the goodness that you have done for your creation and above all, Lord, for your saving power as well. And as we have sung in this uh, last song too, Lord, it's good to be able to come into a garden, any garden, and come alone with you and know that you are there ready to meet us like you're always ready to meet with Adam and Eve in that first uh, garden that you created. And I pray, Lord, that in this new week ahead that you'll help us each to set, a time, set aside time in which we can indeed come to you in our quietness and be able to lay all of our burdens at your feet, knowing that you love us and that you want to uh, care for us and supply our needs. We think of those fathers who are unable to uh, come along uh, to church today. We think of Kath and uh, Chilla, uh, Florence and John especially, Lord. As they uh, carry their burdens, Father, we pray that you will uh, draw near to them, help them to remember that you have invited them to place their burdens upon your shoulders, for your burden is light. And we ask, Father, that you will uh, tend to their needs today. For those who are in charge of caring for them too, Father, that you will give them the wisdom and the skills, the patience, the love that they need to uh, work with not only these folk, Lord, but all of those who are up there on veranda and in the hospital as well. As we open your word this morning, Lord, we uh, learn of the time when you yourself were in a garden, a uh, place that um, offered solitude but certainly didn't offer any uh, solutions at the time of your uh, agony. We pray, Lord, that you'll touch our hearts with your message this morning and that uh, it'll help us to ground us in your love and in our faith in you. So, Father, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is present. We thank you that your Holy Spirit uh, lives in us and we invite that. We invite your Spirit to be with us and in us this morning as we worship and fellowship together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Darlene, let's uh, sing a couple of songs together, shall we? All right, you can all see it to sign. <laughs> All right, our first um, song this morning is More About Jesus I Would Know.
very much. I'd like to invite our deacons to come forward and uplift our offering this morning, please. Father, we thank you for an opportunity to share the uh, lessons, what you have blessed us with. And we pray that uh, this, these uh, offerings and tithes uh, will be used wisely to support your work and the spreading of your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. All boys and girls, come and have a seat down the front. Yep. So, this story is about two boys again. One was named Ken and the other was named Graham. And as you know, Ken, Ken, Ken was a good looking one. And, and, and Graham, well, anyway, they used to enjoy playing at home. Um, Ken, in particular, used to enjoy playing with aeroplanes. He just loved aeroplanes. In fact, his mum got really upset because he could say pain before he could say mama <laughs> as a little baby. Right? And that really upset his mum. When he was about four, an uncle in New Zealand gave him this beautiful, shiny, silver plane. And he would play with it and play with it and play with it and play with it. And his mum used to kick him outside and say, go outside and don't use my kitchen bench for a runway. Go and play outside. But he always came back to that kitchen bench because it was nice and flat. But when he was six, the plane disappeared. It just... Maybe it flew away. Who knows what happened to it? It just disappeared. And Ken started praying, dear Lord, Dear Jesus, please, can you help me find my plane? And his uncle heard about it and sent him another one, exactly the same. But it wasn't quite the same. It was too new. He still prayed for his old one. Well, they used to have a favourite game, especially when their mum and dad were not at home. It's a good game to play in the lounge room when your mum and dad aren't at home. It's called huts and castles. And what you do, you get all your furniture and you tip it upside down and you make huts. Or if you make it very large, you can call it a castle. The challenge, it's a really good game, but the challenge is to get it all back to where it was before mum and dad get home. Otherwise, there might be more than just huts and castles going on. Well, Ken and Graham started building their huts and castles for, for a rare time. Mum and dad weren't at home. 
And as they turned up the, one of the lounge chairs and tipped it upside down, what do you think fell out the back? The very first aeroplane. Well, Ken was so happy he grabbed that plane and he took off outside and Graham kept calling, come back, come back, I have to tip up this lounge the right way. No, says Ken, I found my plane, I found my plane, Jesus has answered my prayer, I'm going to play with it. And poor old Graham was stuck in the lounge room trying to turn up this big lounge chair up the right way before mum and dad got home. He managed so Ken had two of those planes. He was in heaven. Well, he grew older and he grew older and he grew older and he left home. And he didn't take those planes with him. He started to fly real planes. And then he came home for a holiday, a long holiday, and he was turning 40. And he invited some of his school friends around for a birthday party. And at the end of the party, they gave him their gifts, and some were really good gifts, and some weren't so good. And then his mum said, oh, Ken, I've got a special present for you. And so she went and got the present. And she handed it to him, and Ken looked at it and thought, oh. And so, Ken, you know those times when you're getting a present and you really don't like the look of the present, but you've got, <laughs> you've got to be polite? and well-mannered, and so you smile. Thank you, Mum, <laughs> for this lovely present. Because really deep down, I don't think it's a lovely present, but I'll smile anyway. And she said, well, go on, open it up. So I peel back the wrapping and peel back the wrapping, and... Wow. Plane number two. It's not the first one, it's the second one. Well, Ken was very, very happy. And then he started asking, where is plane number one? There's a story that goes that Ken and Graham were arguing over plane one, number one one day. And their father came and got it and flew it up in the sky, away <laughs> over the hedge and into the cow paddock. And so Ken's just waiting for some kind person to bring him a metal detector and he's going to go hunting one day, see if he can find plane number one. But plane number two continues to remind Ken that no matter what you have lost, you can ask Jesus to help you find it. You might have to pray for a very long time, like years and years, but God listens to your prayers. Don't you ever forget it. You can sit down. There are no more stories today. You can always count on a good story, can't we? You can always count on a good story. Thanks so much. How how are we all doing? Had a good week. Yeah, that's good. All the all the rain tanks all filled up. Not yet. Let's have a let's have a word of of prayer. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just want to invite you to be here with us. We invite you into our hearts today, Lord. Speak to us as we open up. The book of John, chapter 18. Draw us nearer to you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Some of you don't know this about me, but I, I used to really like skateboarding. Um, I, used to, I wasn't very good at it, though. I'd fall over it quite a lot. But uh, me, my, my cousin, who was my best, best friend growing up, he was two years older than me. His name was Jared, Uncle Bruce's son. I think so, you know, Uncle Bruce. We used to try to skateboard. We'd try and... Um, do tricks and, and all that and try to go down those, you know, at, at the park there's a bit of a, a skate bowl, you see the kids there? The skate reminds you of a little bit of a bowl that was in a place called uh, Yumina in Central Coast, um, Central Coast, um, north of, we all know Central Coast, right, where that is, north of, of, of uh, Sydney, along the coast there. And there's, you, there was a skate park there me and my cousin used to go to and there's a few um, teenagers there that were probably what you'd say a little bit 
um, rough around the edges, I guess you could say. And so me and my cousin, we were a little bit too as well, but we, we, we came there and um, we had our skateboards and I tried to go down the bowl. As we were leaving the particular skate park, the skate bowl there, there was one little kid that came, had this big rock about this big and he, he, came, he came running down the side. I still remember, me and my cousin were walking away um, from the skateboard. And this one kid, we don't know where his parents were, um, but he was there and he had this massive rock and he, was, he just started pegging these rocks, rocks at me and my cousin. We were dodging and we're like, what on earth? He's about a little guy. A little, me and, I was about 11 years old. My cousin was about 13. He's two years older than me. And we were like, what is going on here? And he just... He'd then he'd, pick, he'd run, pick up that rock again, throw it again and try and get us. And he realized he couldn't, he couldn't hit us. He, he, started, he started swinging at us and punching and trying. And we were dodging and moving out of the way. And I might have pushed him out of the way. Um, but then all of a sudden, coming down where he had come down was what we thought was his older brothers. And his older brothers had seen. We, we didn't lay, hardly lay a hand on this little kid. But the, the, the older brothers, they, they, we could tell they wanted to start something right and, and they were older than us we i was 11 i think they were about 14 15 my cousin was was about 13 i might have been 12 cousin was 14 they might have been 14 15 but they were taller than us and they wanted to we could tell that they wanted to to start something with us with me and my cousin i'm looking i'm, I'm like there's no way I, i'm they'd gone through puberty they've had a lot more puberty i was just about to start in puberty at the age of at 12 and my cousin was kind of and so they're, they're, these two tall teenagers come to start something with us. But then all of it, and we're like, what are we going to do? Like, are we just going to walk away? We can't take, you know, I, I can't. I'm, I'm small and these, and these teenage kids here. What are we going to do? And I could feel my heart racing. And, and, and then all of a sudden, in the corner of my eye, I saw my Uncle Bruce <laughs> running down this and Uncle, this bit intimidating is this dark Maori broad-shouldered Jared's dad come running down down the side and then you should have seen the, the the same face that me and my cousin had when these teenagers came it was the same face that these teenagers had when they saw this big broad Maori dark <laughs> blokes running across the field and he saw the whole thing and you should have seen them and it was it was an interesting uh, confrontation that was there and um, the story we're going to be looking at today was a confrontation between one big group and one smaller group that we'll notice in the book of John chapter 18. We'll notice this confrontation that happened. John chapter 18 and beginning in verse verse 1. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, they, they got scared and they backed away very quickly. Yeah. John chapter 18 and beginning in verse, in verse 1. So notice this confrontation that was here. This, these two s small gangs of people and what happened. One group large, one group small. We'll see what happened. In verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, so we notice the previous few weeks, we've been looking at John chapter 14 to 17, and they're all the sayings of Jesus just before he was to enter in that hour, that dark hour when he was about to get on the cross. And we notice that um, it says, He went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron. Now this brook Kidron was... Um, was east of Jerusalem. Location is believed to be at the foot of the, the Mount of Olives the Gethse and, and Gethsemane that, that's there. The, it's interesting. I've been there um, for one of my, for a Bible lens tour when I was studying theology. I've actually been to where they think this place is, the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's quite amazing being there to think, you know, 2,000 years ago, Jesus was standing here. And there's some olive trees that are there that they that, that are around 2000 years old maybe probably older and when i was there i remember thinking these trees might have been here when jesus was there it's just a fascinating thought these 2000 year old olive trees and see so garden of gethsemane and we continue on it says and there was a garden which he and his disciples entered 
In verse 2, And Judas, who betrayed, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops, now how many was a cohort here? A small cohort, it's probably around 200 soldiers that Judas had taken with him, about 200 soldiers. And how many did Jesus take with him? He had a small group of 11. So you've got 200 soldiers there. And it, sa- and it says, and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees. So like the, these are like the policemen under the priests. These are like the, the, the temple policemen that, that, was, that was taken here. And you can imagine the scene, right? They come to this garden. Here's a secluded place. Judas rats out this secret place that um, Jesus and his disciples went and hung out, had some downtime there. Right of, the, right of the place out, Judas is there. Imagine these, these hardened soldiers there, 200 of them, not including the, the police, the temple police, the temple assistants, the officials, the Pharisees, the leaders, the chief. You know, you can imagine this group coming with swords, lanterns, their, their, their fire torches there. Just picture this coming there and then there's Jesus and his group there. You can imagine how I remember how I was feeling when those two teenagers wanted to come and start something. Imagine how the disciples might have been feeling. They're standing there in the garden and there's this group, this massive group, a lot more scared than, than what we were, I'm sure, coming there, this little group. And you imagine coming up against Jesus, Jesus preaching righteousness and love your enemies and 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 it's it's quite a sight you can imagine that here and then in verse 4 it says jesus therefore knowing all things that would come upon him here's a first hint that jesus despite this whole army that has come up against jesus is still in control this is the first hint there's three hints that we're about to, they're going to be reading today where jesus is in control it's there, you know, they're not in control. This big, this big group of soldiers, hard and tough Roman soldiers, training since, since teenage years. Jesus is in control. He's in control. And he went forward and, 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 and Jesus stepped forward and said, Whom are you, whom you're seeking? Verse 5, they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, here's that word that we've been seeing in the theme of the book of John. I am. I am he. And we have that I am. We've noticed that a few times in the book of John. I am. Ego, I am I in the Greek. I am. And, 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 um, and Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Verse 6. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back. And they fell to the ground. Can you imagine that scene? These 200 soldiers, hardened, rough, tough Roman soldiers standing there with their state-of-the-art weaponry and shields. And they're coming there with their swords and their lanterns. And they've been training since teenage years. There's a whole bunch of them. They've been in battles, hardened men. The temple policemen as well, the tough guys of the Jewish nation. And the tough guys of the Roman nation coming there. And all of a sudden, Jesus says, I am here. And you can imagine they just fall down. What a sight. What a sight that would be. Yeah, what a sight. It makes me think, friends, with all the enemy that is against us in our spiritual walk, all the temptations that can bombard us, all the struggles that we can face in this spiritual battle that we face. You don't need Uncle Bruce by your side. You need Jesus. In these spiritual battles that we face, the temptations, the, the Bible calls the fiery darts that are thrown at us, and how weak we can be sometimes, dear friends, how weak we can be. We cannot do it alone. We can't fight this Christian battle alone. We need Jesus close by our side, don't we? I love the verse, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Verse 7, 
Then he asked them again, Who are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. In John, um, there are a number of titles for Jesus. Um, he was king of, we notice a few times, king of, king of Israel, son of God. Here we have Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, he's a son of God. He's the king of Israel. He's a king. He's a lord of lords. He is the word. He is the great I am. But he's also Jesus of Nazareth. He is the historical Jesus. The historical Jesus of from Nazareth. Fully human. Fully God. Jesus of Nazareth. In verse 8, Jesus answered, I've told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. Here, Jesus is still in control. The second hint that Jesus is in control, the second hint here, he commands them, let them go. I'm here. He commands them. It's a, in a, you can a, let them go. He's in control. Jesus is still in control. They're not, they're not in control. Jesus is in control here. And in verse 9, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke of those. And, and, and we notice this in John 17, 12. Jesus said, of those whom you gave me, I have lost none in, in the prayer to the, of the disciples. Let them go. Does that, is that a picture of the gospel, do you think, dear friends? I am here. Let them go. Can you see the gospel in that? Let them go scot-free. I am here. Let them go. Let Ken go. Let Bill go. Let Lance go. Let Amy go. I have taken their sin on me. Let them off scot-free. In the judgment, Jesus says to her, they're free to go. Let them go. Let the eleven go. Take me. As you can see the, the even a picture of the gospel. Isn't that amazing? You can see the picture of the gospel and probably most of the stories in the Bible. You can see you can see a glimpse of the gospel. And, and the New Testament's no different. Even in the parables, even in the stories, even in the healings, you can see the gospel of Jesus. And here you can. Here's no different. This little story here, you read a few verses on, it's quite amazing where Caiaphas, Caiaphas said, it's expedient that one man die for the people. What a prophecy right there. He didn't even know it. Caiaphas, a few verses after this, says it's expedient or advantageous that one man die for the people. Man, what a picture of the gospel we can see there as well. Isn't that amazing? Hey, I love it. this is it's quite humorous, not for the guy that is, is going to be dealt the little punishment here. But in verse 10, it says, then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest servant and cut off his right ear. What was he thinking? What was Peter thinking right now? Lucky, lucky he was a fisherman, right? Maybe if he had been trained he actually names the high priest servant Malchus. Lucky for Malchus that Peter was just a fisherman and not some kind of swordsmith or combatant. <laughs> he might have had his head chopped off. But here Peter comes and what was, what was Peter thinking? Did he really think that he could come up against these guys? Or maybe he thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to... I'm going, to have another, I'm going to have a swipe and try kickstart this thing. Jesus, you go do that thing again where you, where you made them all fall over. I'm going to, what was Peter thinking? We don't know. This is actually the only mention. The other gospels actually left out the, the name Peter. But here, John, John um, dobs him in here. And, um, and, and Peter is mentioned. And we notice it says the servant's name was Malchus. And verse 11, so Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. In other places in the gospel, Jesus says, "He who lives by the sword will die by the sword." Peter. And then he go. And in another place, he said, "Could I not send twelve legions? You know, one legion being five to six thousand soldiers in the Roman army. A legion, five to six thousand soldiers. 
So you times that by 12, you know, around 60. Could I not send 60 to 70,000 angels if I wanted to? (laughs) He says to Peter. And he could because Jesus is in control. They're not in control. Jesus is in control. And then he says, shall I not? We continue on verse 11. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Jesus is in control. John 10, 17 to 18. John 10, 17 to 18. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have, the, I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I've received from my father, they're not in control. Jesus is in control. What's the word cup mean? Jesus says, drink the cup. What is the cup that he was about to drink? It was the cup of God's fury against sin. Jesus was starting to realize what was happening. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he started realizing, he's saying, Lord, if this cup can pass, your will be done. The sins of the world. Jesus could see what was about to happen. He was about to be separated from his father. The beautiful book, Desire of Ages. I love to read, read a portion of it. And if, if, who's read the Desire of Ages before? It's got a few people. If you ever want to read that book, it's known as one of it, it is known by many in high places as being the greatest biography of Jesus. It is better than any theologian, I believe. Better than any theologian. Have a read of the book Desire of Ages by Alan White. If you don't have a copy, you come and come and chat to me. I want to read an excerpt from Gethsemane chapter. And it just have a, just picture this. Picture this in your mind's eye. You can close your eyes. I'll, I'll read this. It says, Turning away, Jesus sought again his retreat and fell prostrate, overcome by the horror of great darkness. The humanity of the Son of God trembled in that trying hour. He prayed not for his disciples that their faith might not fail, but for his own tempted, agonized soul. The awful moment had come, that moment which was to decide the destiny of the world. The fate of humanity trembled in the balance Christ might even now refuse to drink the cup apportioned to guilty man. It was not yet too late. He might wipe that bloody sweat from his brow and leave man to perish in his iniquity. He was that stressed that he sweated drops of blood to think that he would be taken the guilt and sin of the world. That was an excerpt from me. He might say, let the transgressor receive the penalty of sin and I'll go back to my father. Will the son of God drink the bitter cup of humiliation and agony? Will the innocent suffer the consequences of the curse of sin to save the guilty? The words fall tremblingly upon the pale lips of Jesus. Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Three times has he uttered that prayer. Three times as humanity shrunk from the last crowning sacrifice. But now the history of the human race comes up before the world's redeemer. He sees the transgressors of the law, if left to themselves, must perish. He sees the helplessness of man. He sees the helplessness of man. He sees the power of sin. The woes and lamentations of a doomed world rise before him. 
He beholds its impending fate and his decision is made. His decision is made. He sees the, the great struggle and the, and the cup of, of wrath against sin he was about to, he would have to drink in order to save people, to save humanity, to save those who would come to him. He made up, and, and I love this, he beholds its impending fate and his decision is made. It's his decision. He's in control. It's his decision. And what's his decision? And it goes on. He will save man at any cost. He will save man at any cost. He accepts his baptism of blood that through him perishing millions, perishing millions may gain everlasting life. He has left the courts of heaven where all is purity, happiness and glory to save the one lost sheep. He is the one lost sheep, the one world that has fallen by transgression. And he will not turn from his mission. He will become the propitiation of a race that is willed to sin. His prayer now breathes only submission if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Thy will be done. Jesus in control. Jesus in control. Greater, greater love has, has, has no one than this, than to lay down your life for your friends. And Jesus laid down his life for you. Dear friends, we're going to be closing and singing our song, Nearer, Still Nearer. And may we grow nearer and nearer to Jesus.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we see that you are in control. You laid down your life for us, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for your grace towards us, for your love towards us, and for the blood that was spilt from you, Lord, on Calvary to save us, Lord. It's through your blood, it's through your, your death that we are saved, that we have any hope of being saved. It's only through you. And we thank you, Lord, that, um, Lord, we know that you struggled there in Gethsemane. You sweated drops of blood because you struggled with the stress of it, Lord, taking the sins of the world, being separated. In your, in your mind's eye, Lord, you, you didn't know if you were going to be coming through on the other end, Lord. That was how serious the, pun, the, the sin is, Lord, and, and the judgment against it. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, and we want to accept that in our lives. We want to accept the wonderful gospel in our lives, Lord Jesus. We want to live the gospel in our lives. We want to be gracious just as as you are gracious and kind, Lord, we want that as well. Just as you are just, we want to be just. Just as you are truthful, Lord, we want to be truthful. We want to follow you, Lord, with all of our hearts. So, Lord, be with us today and draw us nearer, still nearer to you is our prayer. In the wonderful name of, of, of you, our dear Lord. Amen. Amen. Just a quick announcement, dear friends. Uh, next week, we're going to have a music program, so make sure you come along to that. We have a, a few special items um, from the Uniting Church and from um, All Saints Church and from our church as well. So I want you to come along, and I believe there's a lunch as well next Saturday, so come along and enjoy. It's a nice potluck lunch. God bless. Yeah.